Hello, everyone. Welcome and thank you for joining us today for another edition of IRENA Insights webinar series. My name is Elisa Asmelash and I'm from the IRENA Innovation and Technology Center in Bonn. Most of you know IRENA, but let me make a quick introduction of who we are. We are an intergovernmental organization with 161 member countries. We support countries in their transition to a sustainable energy future and serve as a platform for international cooperation, center of excellence, and repository of policy, technology, resource, and financial knowledge on renewable energy. Our analytical work and our engagement with our member countries generates a lot of valuable insights, and we're constantly looking for more ways to share them. This is why we have launched the fortnightly IRENA Insight webinar program, where every other week we share with you key findings from our latest work. We offer you insights into opportunities, trends, best practices, but also innovative solutions to address various challenges. We aim to keep these webinars short, approximately 30 minutes, so we cannot cover everything, but we hope to give you enough to decide whether to delve deeper and we will signpost further sources of more in-depth information to help you to do that. Today's webinar will be focused on the 2019 report, Advanced Biofuels, What Holds Them Back? The transport sector, sector represents a third of today's global energy demand, yet it has the lowest level of renewable energy use today. Biofuels can offer readily available solutions for decarbonizing transport as an alternative to fossil fuels and as a complement to the enhanced role of electric mobility. IRENA's climate-friendly scenario indicates that a five-fold increase of biofuels would be needed by 2050. However, many barriers are holding back the scale-up of biofuels deployment. Today's webinar will share practical insights into the complex business environment of biofuels and discuss ways forward. Our speakers today are Toshima Samasuyama and Sengu Kang, our IRENA experts. Their presentation will be a maximum 20 minutes long to allow another 10 minutes for uh, your questions. But before I hand over the micro microphone to Sengo and Tosh Toshimasa, I have a few housekeeping items to cover. Today's webinar will be as usual recorded and available together with the presentation slides on IRENA's webinar website under past webinars. The previous webinar recordings and slides are already there and we invite you to visit them. The link to the website will be again shared with you in the follow-up email. All of you are currently muted and will remain so throughout the webinar. We would love to hear from you to the, during today's presentation. If you have any questions to our speakers, please send uh, them us, to us through the question feature that you can find on the webinar panel. We will be monitoring questions throughout the session and select some to be answered by our speakers. Due to time constraints, we apologize in advance if your question is not answered. You may also download the presentation slides in the hands out section that include all important links to IRENA Bioenergy materials. If you experience any technical difficulties, please try to reconnect by dialing in via phone. You can get the number by clicking on the phone option located on the webinar panel. Otherwise, please, please visit support service on the GoToWebinar website. And without any further ado, let me kick things off by welcoming Toshimasa and Sengo. Sengo, over to you. Thank you, Elisa, and welcome everyone to our webinar on advanced biofuel. My name is Sengo Gang, and I'm working for bioenergy team in Arena. I will first try to give an overview of the position of bioenergy in global energy transition and short introduction to the advanced biofuels. Then my colleague Tushimasa Masuyama will discuss the barriers and opportunities of advanced biofuels. Bioenergy is today the largest source of renewable energy. In 2017, 14% of 586 exajoules of total primary energy supply came from renewable energy, of which 67% was from bioenergy. Based on the findings from our latest report, Global Renewable Energy Outlook published last month, bioenergy is expected to provide more than a third of the total renewable energy supply in 2050 under both planned energy scenario and transforming energy scenario, which is in line with the climate goal of the Paris Agreement. 
overall, the primary supply of modern bioenergy would have to grow from around 28 exajoules in 2017 to 125 exajoules by 2050 in the transforming energy scenario, which means uh, more than a, a fourfold increase. Within the 125 exajoules of bioenergy demand, the power sector has the largest share, accounting for 34%. Nonetheless, bioenergy should be deployed in a versatile manner for transport fuels and industry. Among the end user sectors, transport sector has shown a steady growth of CO2 emissions and is now the largest emitter. However, the sector shows the lowest renewable uptake and thus requires more efforts and attention to bring down the emission level. Transport sector decarbonization could be achieved by three main pathways. First, the energy demand for transport needs to be reduced through energy efficiency improvement, such as deploying advanced digital communication technologies, promoting mobility services, including vehicle sharing and autonomous driving, and modal shift from passenger cars to public transport. Secondly, it needs a rapid uptake of electric mobility together with renewable electricity. Last but not least, we need to foster biofuels, especially for the transport modes which are hard to electrify, such as heavy duty flights, aviation and shipping. Liquid biofuel needs a fivefold increase from 136 billion liter in 2017 to 651 billion liters by 2050. This translates into 15 billion liters of additional biofuel production every year. With all these efforts combined, the share of renewable energy will reach 57% of energy demand in the transport sector. 18 gigajoules of biofuels will be needed, which is nearly half of fossil fuel in demand. This implies also the blend wall needs to be broken and advanced biofuels should be put in place. To support transport sector decarbonization and the use of biofuel, 70 countries have already implemented biofuel blending mandates as of end 2019. Also, the number of countries introducing biofuel mandates for advanced biofuels is increasing. Despite of this effort, the industry as a whole, including both conventional and advanced biofuels, demonstrates a limited or at best moderate appetite for new investments. In the last two decades, growing support for biofuels triggered a substantial investment boom, which peaked in 2007. Uh, when several sustainability, sustainability concerns relating to the impacts of biofuels on food security, food and feed prices, and on direct and indirect land use change uh, became an in integral part of the international climate and in energy debate. The production of biofuels has continued to grow, however, mostly utilizing the existing biofuel refinery capacity and its annual increments. Investments in advanced biofuels have also been on a decreasing trend since 2011. But to achieve the five-fold increase goal, more than 100 refineries should be de developed annually at an investment, investment cost of over 20 billion US dollars, which are far above today's investment level. Meanwhile, some liquid technology from Clarient demonstrated new developments in the production of cellulosic ethanol using agricultural residues, straws in four countries in Europe and China during this stagnating period. I will now hand over the mic to my colleague, Tushimasa Masuyama, to talk about identifying the barriers to advanced biofuel investments. Hello. Uh, can you, you can hear me? Yep. Uh, my name is Toshimasa Masuyama. Uh, thank you, Sung Wu. Um, as already explained, as Irina, we have um, published a report entitled Advanced Biofuels, what hold them back November last year, with the aim to clarify the factors explaining the stagnating investment activity in advanced biofuels. So our study was based on a review of past literature, but also we conducted a survey by sending questionnaires to 
industry uh, executives in companies that have already invested in second generation biofuel productions. So um, this study focuses exclusively on the views of biofuels industry representatives. Uh, other stakeholders such as policymakers, research, NGOs are not reflected in this uh, study. Um, I'm trying to move on to the next. Yep, sorry. Yep, um, so from next uh, page, I would like to share with you some of the key findings of a survey. And um, so, first of all, um, you know, the, the, in this graph, uh, the color in blue shows agreement and color in red shows disagreement and uh, light green shows in the middle. So first of all, the, 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 uh, in terms of feedstock, respondents deny the statement that there is not enough feedstock for expansion of the bounce bar fuels. But um, opinions in this area are somewhat dependent on technological pathways. For example, lignocellulose ethanol producers did not see any major uh, concerns about feedstock availability, but uh, HBO or HEPA producers uh, see them as, as a kind of um, impediment. Um, and second, and competing uses for biomass feedstock may be an issue. And third, uh, in terms of technology uh, matureness, uh, technology for HEPA uh, production is mature, whereas lignocellulose, ethanol, and also thermal chemical producers are still battling with the risks and barriers associated with the early stage of commercialization. And fourth, uh, lignocellulose biofuels will reach significant volume, uh, very affirmative. And fifth, uh, in terms of uh, final, uh, financing, uh, the, of course, there is a need for public support to realize first of the kind commercial level refineries. And <laughs> sorry, it takes time to move on to the next one. Yeah. Um, the on this page, uh, it talks about mandates, targets, and demand. So first one is very bluish. Uh, you know, the investors send a clear message to policymakers calling for more stable and predictable investment environment for biofuels. So it's very natural because it takes several years to develop a refinery and anticipated returns should be yielded in the following more than 10 years or 15 years of operation, assuming that original assumptions remain valid. And second, um, there is no unanimous perspective from the respondents on what regulatory mechanisms are best for promoting biofuels. However, uh, technology neutral fuel standards are favored by majority. So this could diversify the transport fuel sources such that there has been substantial increase in the deployment of ethanol, renewable diesel, biomethane, biojet, and also uh, EVs electricity. So this, the creation of an enabling environment for advanced biofuel deployment requires a much more nuanced and multifaceted regulation than for any other forms of renewable energy. So and third, there are supporters of EVs, but on the other hand, there's uh, some seeing them as a threat for biofuels, depending on the business objectives of the company are uh, represented by the respondent. And fourth, um, flex fuel vehicles, yeah, have some support within ethanol producers, but those focusing on dropping fuels do not see them as playing an important role in decarbonizing transport. And fifth, um, uh, we, no, yeah, sorry, <laughs> uh, aviation, uh, the uh, dropping fuels producers and uh, heifer producers see them uh, a good opportunity for uh, by aviation. And next, so, and the uh, environmental and social concerns 
So there is too much confusion about how life cycle GHG emissions are estimated very affirmative. Um, methods used for estimating land use change impacts of various biofuels are accurate and reliable, um, very negative. And third, uh, environmental advocacy groups have helped advance second advanced biofuels, uh, mostly negative. And fourth, um, investments are hampered by worries that sustainability criteria may become more stringent. Uh, so in this opinion, um, the, the opinion is split uh, between affirmative and negative. Um, so lastly, uh, we also did uh, uh, ask the ranking questions. So respondents are requested to provide the most three significant barriers. So from here, I, I just want to point out that um, you know st stability of regulation, um, you know, regulatory uncertainty, uh, standouts as the main major impediment to investment in second bio, uh, in, in, in the advanced part of biofuels. But of course, other, other barriers are included, such as availability and cost of financing and technology issues, etc. So and and the next so next slide please. So yes, so after the release of the report, of course, um, you know the most uh, significant impact on, on on the business environment is COVID nineteen. So uh, so I think we need to briefly touch upon how biofuels pathway can be impacted by COVID nineteen. And first, of course, the you know the sharp fall in demand for transport fuels combined with the drop in oil prices have caused dual hardships for biofuels industry. As a result, a number of cases of biofuels plant closure have been reported. But, uh, however, a few signs of an improvement have already emerged. And also, um, regulatory changes uh, with positive signals for the market have been announced. For, uh, for example, French airline bail plans with environment, uh, environmental conditions uh, include uh, alternative jet fuels and also the removal of, of the uh, ethanol ban in Indonesia is announced according to uh, US Greens Council's website. And so in that sense, policies play a more crucial role, not only in supporting short-term recovery, but also in providing longer-term predictability for market expansion. Um, so, uh, in, in the context of the, the, the external benefits biofuels, we, uh, it's, it's, it's fair to say bioenergy creates large volume of employment, uh, and so that will provide rationale for stimulus package as well. So, according to our um, job data, uh, biofuels offer the largest job of opportunities among different renewable sources at the global scale outside China because China is a, a predominant world solar sectors, you know, uh, related job. So then, uh, lastly, we, uh, in, in conclusion, um, biofuels can provide readily available sources. Uh, for decarbonizing the transport sector while complementing the enhanced role of electrification and other, other measures. And biofuels play a major role in displacing fossil fuels, uh, particularly for long haul transport such as aviation and shipping in for the longer term. But for in, in order to align with the climate safe scenario, a five in, four increase of production capacity of biofuels is needed. And to do so, uh, we you know, that uh, we need a lot of huge investment. But the the past trends show that the level of investment required for the fivefold increase is economically feasible. And again, the policy uncertainty is found to be the most significant barrier to investment in biofuels. So public and private dialogue is is, is the key for the success. And, but in, 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 on, on top of the policy aspect, other barriers such as technology, cost competitive, cost competitiveness, financing, 
uh, infrastructure or any specifications such as brand limits or sustainability issues need to be addressed in a balanced manner that we know that all solutions are at hand. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Toshima San Sengwo, for the insightful presentation. Let me go directly to the questions. We already received some uh, good ones. Thank you for them. Uh, let me start uh, with this one. How do you assess the economic visibility of advanced biofuels given their higher cost of production? Uh, so thank you. Uh, yes, maybe I, 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 I can answer that question. The, you know, the, in, yes, the, uh, according to Irina's past assessment, the yeah, the advanced biofuels production costs could become only competitive with fossil fuels at above 100 US dollars per, per barrel. So at below 80 dollars per barrel, uh, advanced biofuels pathways are unlikely to be able to compete directly with gasoline or diesel. Um, and um, but of course, you know that the production costs are expected to decrease as technology further improves or regulation becomes more favorable and the economy of scale is enhanced. However, it is difficult to foresee a dramatic decline of cost of biofuels production, uh, as we have seen in the case of solar and wind, because you know that the largest fraction of production cost is feedstock and its cost share is in the range of you know, 40 or up to 70% of total production costs. So, um, you know, this makes bioenergy dis you know, disadvantageous in the cost competitiveness. But uh, in my view, the, the feedstock production has um, a variety of ripple effects for the local economy, not only job creation, but also, for example, income generation for local farmers or reduced cost for waste management or post-harvest management. So, um, so in that sense, there is much room for boosting biofuels production feedstock if you know pro policies address all those external effects in a, in a fair manner. So that that is not the one way uh, we can address the you know. Uh, lower cost competitiveness of biofuels. Thank you, Toshi. Um, there is another question uh, uh, divided in two parts. So first part, are there any impact on goods prices as a result of advanced biofuel use policies? And secondly, what is better to use third generation advanced biofuel or fourth generation? The, the the first question is in a, um, impact on the good prices. Yes, as a result of advanced biofuels use. Um, yeah, thank you. The uh, you know the, the main objective of our study is um, how advanced biofuels can be uh, scaled up. But the fact is that you know among the total production of biofuels. You know, advanced by the share of biofuels is still very marginal, I would say, only you know, less, around you know five percent or so. So at the moment the market is dominated by so-called conventional biofuels uh, uh derived from corn, ethanol, or or, or uh sugarcane. So at, at this moment, you know, the uh, I uh, I, I don't think there, there's not so much huge impact uh, coming out of the advanced biofuels for, for the over you know pricing or, or economy economy. But in the future, maybe you know we should consider uh, you know competing uses of biomass for different purposes, not only transport fuels, but also uh, solid biofuels for other purposes, for industry sectors, for heating purposes, or, or maybe biochemicals. So that will be the major determinant factors to, 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 for, for the pricing of goods. And um, the second question, you know, I, I'm not sure what the fourth <laughs> generation biofuels means that and normally, uh, you know, the third 
generation biofuels are ref referred to as the biofuels coming from algae, uh, we have um, estimated the potential of the uh, third generation biofuels coming, coming from algae. But again, this is still at the very early stages of research and development. I, we know that, that there are some, some demonstration plants, but the impact for the whole market is still negligible. So yeah, we have to wait and see how uh, research and development for the third generation uh, biofuels could advance at this for the moment. Thank you, Toshimasa. Um, let me take another question. Um, could you kindly elaborate on how advanced biofuels will significantly improve the overall sustainability of biofuels in terms of land use, biodiversity, water consumption, compared to the uh, first generation biofuels? Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, the, yes, sustainability issue is a very important topic. And, and also, uh, according to our studies, and some, some respondents uh, clearly stated that you know, reputational risk are coming out of those big concerns is, um, is one of the major barriers for investment in biofuels. So, um, but you know, we have seen some some progress in 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 the articulation of sustainability. In you know, in how sustainability is defined. For example, uh, already in, in in Europe, for example, a renewable the device renewable energy directive has, has defined the sustainability of of, of biofuels. This is a good sign for the market, and but 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 you know. Uh, here, I'd like to mention that, you know, again, you know, the sustainability of biofuels cannot be addressed only by biofuels. Of course, you know, land use change is a very uh, critical topic, but land use is not driven only by biofuels. For example, you know, it is often the case, uh, for example, you know, palm oil, is is referred to as a major dry, driver for deforestation but you know the in case of expansion of palm oil plantations for example uh, palm oil you know oil uh, palm oil can be used for vegetable oils for for food or or, or for uh, industrial uses for for surfactants for example so i think you know it might be we, we need a a little bit more holistic view how sustainability should be discussed. Uh, of course, biofuels is, is, is one of the major contributors uh, where, where in places where uh, land use change is happening. But, you know, in, in addition to, to make it more, more, more clearly defined, also we need to have a more integrated approach to to ensure or, or the harm, you know harmonized approach of the sustainability. I hope this answers the question. Thank you, Toshimasa. I'll, I think we have time again uh, for another couple of questions. Um, are biofuels well suited for urban transportation in developed markets? Should we not just make the leap EVs? As biofuels will likely be transitory energy source. Yes. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Please go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, Elisa. Uh, and the, yes, uh, the EV is now the important uh, transport mode for decarbonization of transport, especially for the private uh, cars, light duty vehicles. But also biofuel will play, uh, meanwhile, the transit, transitory role. And then there are transport modes hard to electrify, like aviation and shipping and heavy duty freight trucks. So in this case, biofuel would play a major role to decarbonize the, the transport sector. Thank you, Sengwo. I'll probably uh, ask a last one. 
which types of biomass sources do you envisage to play a major role in displacing fossil fuels? Yeah, the, thank you for the question. You know, to, to simply say, it depends on the local circumstances. Uh, you know, biomass uh, uh, plant resources. So, uh, so the types of plants are very much different from 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 place to place. Uh, so, but we know that you know uh, we in, in the context of advanced biofuels, we focus on agricultural residues or from you know forestry residues. Uh, generated alongside the uh, value change of agriculture or forestry. So, you know, in, in, in case of Clarion, the, you know, the San, San Luque technologies, uh, the, the, this technology is based on uh, using straws uh, as feedstock for advanced biofuels. So maybe straw uh, is one of the promising feedstock. But also we, we have bagasse in the case of sugarcane and also um, you know forest residues, you know, for woody biomass can be combat we, we can be combated uh, to to biofuels and so technology already out there. Um, yeah, we have you know the, the, the potential is huge, potential is huge, you know, why? So the so the, the the what we should focus on is you know each region or each locality has its own clear pathways or the designs or, or political wills to make use of those resources. Thank you, Toshimasa. Unfortunately, time is up. Thank you for sending us insightful questions to choose from and so much and so much to learn from you, Toshimasa and, Toshimasa and Singbo. Thank you very much for sharing all these insights and your experience with all of us. Let me finish with um, this very interesting webinar with a couple of final announcements. To be able to reflect on the delivery of our webinar and way to improve it, we also uh, would like, um, and what you would like us to cover in the future editions, we would appreciate your feedback. We would like to invite you to complete a very short satisfactory survey which will appear at the end of the webinar and the link will be shared with you also in the follow-up email. We're monitoring your comments and we work on selecting topics of your interest and trying to shift times of webinars to accommodate various time zones. Thank you in advance for completing the survey which has been very helpful. And last but not least, we would like to invite you to um, two next editions of this fortnightly webinar series. The first one will be um, the, the role of hydrogen, of green hydrogen in reaching zero emissions. And it will take place on the 7th of July at 3 p.m. CET. The second one on dynamic regulation and innovations in enabling technologies for renewable power future will be on the 20th of July at 4 p.m. CET. You can already register on the ARENA website and the link will be again shared with you in our follow-up email. You can register on the ARENA website. The link is shared here in the presentation with you and you will receive a follow-up email with the link as well. So this is all from us today. Once again, I would like to thank our speakers and all of you to joining us today. Goodbye and see you soon.